So it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today uh, for our Carla Lunchtime presentation. Beth Dillard is a Carla Fellow and also a PhD candidate in Second Language Education in the College of Education and Human Development. She's also a 2016 recipient of the American Association for Applied Linguistics Graduate Student Multilingual Matters Award. And she'll be speaking to us today about the dissertation's topic, about her research on uh, language instructors and lesson study in higher education. And I just want to point out that her presentation today is being video recorded. So you know. <laughs> Um, I really appreciate everybody being here. Thanks, Elaine. Um, and also, before I do anything else, thanks to Carla for letting me be a Carla fellow for the year. It's been a really fun one. Thank you very much. All right. Well, here we go. So, uh, today I want to share with you from my dissertation research, and it's, it's in progress, so I'm going to share with you some pieces of it. Um, this is the teaser trailer edition, so if you want to come back for my defense on May 10th, you can even meet my parents. They're hilarious. Um, so what I want to do is share with you, um, especially from a portion that a group of us, the group of us that worked on this project, um, shared what was it, nine, ten months ago at the International Language Teacher Educator Conference um, here in Minneapolis um, this past May. So <coughs> pieces from that and also ways I've, I've worked on it since then. So I'm going to take you quickly through theory and some situating research, and then really I want to get into sharing a few excerpts of, of data. So okay, as you can see from the title, um, I'm going to be talking about something called lesson study. Um, how many of you are familiar with lesson study? <laughs> All right, <laughs> two people I talk to a lot. Okay, excellent. All right, so they're actually, no, nope. it was actually on NPR a few weeks ago. They did a really, really <laughs> awesome documentary about an hour long, and they were looking at a lesson study project going on with teachers in Chicago. And the project they talked about is pretty typical of what lesson study projects are, which is they're typically used in elementary level, and they're typically used with mathematics. So what I, um, I learned about lesson study maybe 10 years ago when I was getting my master's in, at the University of Oregon, and uh, one of my professors had just learned about it and was experimenting with it, and so I got to be in one of these groups. And I thought it was a really interesting tool, and I sort of honestly forgotten about it until a couple years ago, and I, I thought, oh, that was such an awesome experience. And so um, it's sort of come full circle now that I've gotten to work with the group using it. So um, today I want to talk about a way that a group of us here at the university um, modified this for the context of language instructor professional development. And um, oh, I'll figure this out eventually. Um, and I just want to say up front that the five of us, we had a conversation about sort of anonymity or not. And we decided as a group that we wanted um, to share everyone's names and, and pictures. And so I'm going to introduce you to the group um, here in a little while. And probably most of you in the room know them, and they're such fabulous people. So I'm excited that I can um, share with you some of the work that they've been doing. So to put this in a larger context briefly, in 2014, summer of 2014, the CLA Language Center, we received um, a grant to support language proficiency initiatives um, here at the university. We got this grant along with uh, the University of Utah and also Michigan State. And um, out of this uh, grant, we are we're in year two of the PACE project. So proficiency assessment for curricular enhancement. And we're really excited about some of the work we've been able to do in the last year and a half. Um, it has sort of a three-pronged approach. 
Um, first of all, we do proficiency testing, and by that, typically what that means is we give actual exams, um, all but writing. So we do all the modalities except for writing. Um, and then we've given those tests now to nearly 900 students. Right, Dan? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I was doing the math this morning and it sounded about right. Okay. Um, along with having these students across seven different languages take uh, these various proficiency exams to see sort of their global levels, we're also um, putting, um, having students work with their own self-assessment. And our lovely resident, Gabriela Sweet, has really been instrumental in making that happen. Um, and so we want students to not only have these experiences taking proficiency tests to give us some information about how they're doing, but we really want to build in them um, a sustainable way of, of thinking and taking ownership about their own behavior. The third prong is then professional development initiatives. And I'll introduce somebody else to you. So then we have Adolfo um, Carillo Cabello, and he has just recently joined us as the coordinator for professional development as part of this project. And so in sum, what we're hoping through these three things is to really have them influence each other, and that some of the information that is gained about where our students are at will then have an influence also on um, broader curricular change and um, instructor teaching. So I got involved with this and um, since nearly the beginning, not quite the beginning, since nearly the beginning, and I've gotten to work in various aspects of the project. And my dissertation research came out of the work I got to do with the professional development side of the project and has been um, really, really fun. So we had sort of a problem of practice, and that's what I zeroed in on. Which was that, you know, we're planning, we planned several workshops that um, were well attended, were really interesting. Um, people talked about getting a lot out of them. Um, we were providing these peak experiences. But what we were finding that was challenging for us was to figure out how in very concrete ways to support sustained growth of language instructors over time. So out of this then, I, um, the study is one way of thinking about addressing this challenge um, and through taking the tactic of teacher learning through inquiry. Um, that is professional development activities that support language teachers' own action research um, and structure opportunities for their own reflection about what they're doing in the classroom. All right, so how am I framing all of this? Um, lesson study sits at the center of the, of the work, but then how is it embedded within a larger dissertation project? So this is my new piece of refrigerator art. Isn't that beautiful? I'm really proud of it. Very nice. <laughs> Just joking. Um, so I know you can't see it yet. I'm going to talk through it briefly as a way of sort of telling a story of how these pieces fit together. So broadly speaking, the entire study is uh, situated within sociocultural theory. So this looks at the work of Vygotsky, or it's, it's based in the work of Vygotsky. This is something we're very familiar with. It's, it's really um, pulled together a lot of the work we've done in the field over the years. So Vygotsky pulled on behaviorism, so we don't go straight from a stimulus to a response as behaviorism claimed. He said, well, there's mediating artifacts, be they physical or be they symbolic, that mediate um, people's actions, people's thinking. So um, not only does sociocultural theory, does it serve as sort of the his historical ancestor to other things I'm pulling on theoretically, like cultural historical activity theory or communities of practice, but Vygotsky's um, double stimulation method becomes really important later on. So I'm gonna really briefly touch on what that is. Um, at the core of it, double stimulation is simply giving individuals a problem space and then giving them some tools to see what they'll do with it, how they'll try to solve the problem that you give them. Um, but then, the way that Vygotsky tested this out is he used some blocks. And he gave these to kids and he said, okay, group them. Any ideas how you'd group them? 
color, shape, flavor. I like where Sean's going. <laughs> you must be a parent. <laughs> so there's four groups. These are the groups. Everything that's short and large, everything that's short and small, everything that's tall and large, everything that's tall and small. And the way that these four groups are marked is by um, the, same, the same four get the same three-letter sequence. So the idea in this is that um, the kids that worked through these would start to realize, or maybe, um, what the role language was, if that was a useful tool for them in solving the issue. So hang on to that. I'm going to come back to it in just a second, the role, what double stimulation does. So giving people a problem space and then potential tools like labeling the blocks to see what they'll do with it. All right. So, um, sorry. So then, um, like I said before, the, the main theoretical framework that I'm using is cultural historical activity theory. This came sort of both simultaneously with Vygotsky and then later after him with um, Ingstrom. And what, um, what activity theory does is it takes Vygotsky's triangle and it builds on it. So instead of having the unit of analysis be the individual, and what is the individual doing? It's looking at the activity system. So. Um, we still have the individual, the subject, trying to accomplish some sort of goal using mediating artifacts. But there's these other factors in the socio-cultural historical environment that are giving, affording and constraining what the individual is able to do. Um, so rules, for example, um, these are the things that guide people's behavior, spoken and unspoken. Um, the community, who are the different individuals that are part of the system that is... Um, leading to this potential goal-driven activity. And then labor, how is labor divided up? So this has to do a lot with power. Um, how do different individuals um, have different roles in the process? Engstrom, third generation activity theory, then he said, well, you know, there's actually multiple activity systems going together and these are interacting and there's contradictions inside the systems and between the systems. And Engstrom really theorizes that um, it's at these points of contradiction that something called expansive learning happens. So this is a way of visualizing dialogue, multiple perspectives, and networks of interaction. And it's really, this is a useful frame. I like it a lot because it helps us view entire complex systems. All right. And then I'm not going to say anything about communities of practice. This is something that's been around in the field for a long time. Um, but I'm pulling also on the idea of communities of practice and, and what that says about um, these groups that get together. So then methodology. So um, one incarnation of cultural historical activity theory is developmental work research. This is something Engstrom has really worked out. And this is where the second stimulus comes back. So um, the idea of Vygotsky's blocks then has been reused, rethought about, to think about learning in organizations as a whole. Um, and I should point out also that cultural historical activity theory is useful because it's both a theoretical framework and a methodology. So in developmental work research, um, what happens is we make the unit of analysis a process rather than a product. So we're focusing on um, the process of learning that's happening or of the activity that's happening. So in reconceptualizing this, then, the researcher's analytic gaze, we direct it to the mediation of the subject or the participant, whoever they are, their activity using real tools and psychological tools. So the first stimulus in developmental work research takes the form of, they call it a mirror. And the idea is that instead of giving the individual the problem, you show to them their own activity so that they actually identify what the problems are themselves, which is why inquiry-based learning fits nicely into this, because you're helping individuals just to simply look at their own activity and make sense of it. Then the second stimulus is still a possible tool. So this is the same as the letters on the blocks. So you give them a possible tool. And so this is where lesson study finally comes in. 
Um, the idea is that lesson study is a possible tool um, to address some of the questions that come up for teachers about um, how to make life better in the classroom. And so here I've, I've really pulled on the work of um, Yoshida, who brought lesson study to the US through his dissertation, and then also Catherine Lewis, who I'll talk about in just a, just a second. All right, so the idea then is simply that developmental work research adds in a second stimulus, a new mediating artifact. Okay, so lesson study, what is it? Um, it's been around in Japan for about 100 years, and it's evolved over the course of the 20th century um, in Japan. It ended up in the US in a few different sort of um, parallel, but only tangentially connected ways. So one was through Yoshida's dissertation research, and then he actually, um, his advisor ended up really jumping on the idea of lesson study and did a lot of work um, with that through the 90s and the early 2000s. Lewis's story, though, I think is pretty funny. So Catherine Lewis was in Japan. She was observing elementary classrooms, and she was seeing, she was there to actually look at behavior management and classroom management, and she noticed that um, the way that the teachers were teaching math was really interesting to her. So the teacher would give the students a word problem and wouldn't say anything about it. Would just give them the word problem and set them out on their own and say, find as many possible ways as you can to solve this problem. And then they'd come back together and the students would share their different answers and um, then the teacher would scaffold that conversation. And so she said, where'd you all learn to teach like this? And they said, well, from you in the US. And she said, no, you didn't. And sure enough, she was pulling on, these teachers were pulling on research that was coming out of the US. And so she thought, well, why is it that this research is getting integrated in Japan in ways that it is not getting integrated in the US? And so then she really switched her focus over to the kinds of professional development they do. And so what they do is this very um, systematic um, program, in a sense, called lesson study, Jugyu Kinkyu. And it, in Japan, it, it, can, it exists at the school level. It can be a, sort of a huge deal to the point where some of the product that is created gets shared not only for the entire school and these large celebrations, but even in the entire community. It gets invited in to see, in a sense, the research that the teachers have been doing in the form of them showing off some of the lessons that they've really worked on. So the cycle, and this is what has been pulled into the US context, um, is starting by teachers formulating a question that they have, sort of their own problem of practice. What is um, puzzling them? What's flummoxing them in their classrooms? Um, and so they together in small groups, they do some research on this. So it might be they do some reading. It might be that they um, go and observe other teachers in different places. Whatever they find is useful to them to try to think about um, the problem that they have on hand. Out of this, they create one lesson, just one. And they pour their thinking about whatever the issue is into this one sort of exemplar test lesson. The group then chooses one person, it could be anybody in the group, delivers the lesson while everybody else that's in that group comes and observes. So uh, one thing here is the administration obviously devotes a lot of resources to making this happen by freeing people up to be able to do this, okay? Um, so then what, what they can do is, um, and the picture, let's see if I can do this real quick. Ooh, that's magic, okay. so. These teachers that are standing around the room, they're observing a lesson. And they are literally treating it like they're collecting data about what is it, how are the students tackling um, the lesson, the learning that they've set before them. And so lesson study really works best when teachers are able to move their gaze from what is it that the teacher is doing to what is it that the students are doing. So collecting data in that sense of, Where's the proof in the pudding, so to speak? How is it that the learners are taking up the ideas that we're trying about instruction? 
So after that happens then, the group comes back together and they debrief um, the lesson that just happened. And again, this is a challenge um, because it's so, we're so trained to look at what the teacher is doing. Um, and you'll see that in my data. It was really a struggle to stay focused on what the students are doing. Um, but the idea is then they come together, they reflect on what worked and what didn't work for the students, and then they refine the lesson. Somebody else delivers it, and then they reflect a second time on it. And typically these go in cycles of twos, so coming back to the same lesson a couple times. All right, so now in this study, how did we use it? I'm just going to skip past. Well, I'll just briefly say the end of that large, large diagram of how I'm conceptualizing the entire study. Um, a, there is one really cool study by Thomas Tasker, to who I am indebted. Uh, a couple years ago, his dissertation, he combined lesson study and he combined activity theory. What I'm adding to his way of conceptualizing it is using conversation analysis. So. His analysis really focused on content analysis. It looked at big, broad themes, what teachers were expressing. Um, what I'm hoping to do by adding conversation analysis is look at the micro-interactional level and see how that itself mediates conceptual development in teachers. Okay, so how did we adapt lesson study? Because we definitely didn't use it exactly in the way I just described. So this is our, our inquiry group, uh, Ayumi, so in the, the far left, in the green, this is Rasha Elhil. Um, in the middle back, this is Sugyung Kim. This is me when I had short hair. <laughs> uh, then in the bottom, we've got Ayumi Mita on the left and Minori Inada on the right. And we came together almost accidentally, um, but formed over time this really, um, really meaningful group um, where we were able to have um, deep discussions about the teaching that was happening in their classrooms and to really share some of our, our struggles and our successes as well. So we started, the group started, I served uh, as a facilitator of sorts for the group and um, introduced the idea of lesson study as a possibility we could take up, um, which we ended up doing. And so the first thing that we tried to figure out was what did we want to ask about? What was our question? And so something that had been coming up in the weeks prior, excuse me, was the problem, the challenge, I guess, of engagement. So how do we build and sustain it and have it be student-centered, not teacher-centered? And so they really, um, they were really getting all these different ideas from different sources, um, and they really wanted to do this, but they weren't quite sure how to make it actually happen in practice, right? So they wanted to see how the other ones in the group were trying to make it happen. So the way that we organized it, um, we came together and did some, some thinking and some study about engagement. But we didn't end up creating a one lesson just because um, they teach three different languages and at different levels. And it didn't make sense to create one lesson, though that's something they've talked about doing in the future, is choosing a similar topic and then building one lesson that actually applies at these different languages and across different levels. Um, but that's in the future. So we started actually with a teaching observation. Um, so we observed, we all went in and watched one of the group members teach. Then we came back together and did a debrief of the observation. I recorded and transcribed the orange bubble, <laughs> the group debrief of the, of the observation. And then from that, I um, gave it to them a few days ahead of time and said, read through it, see what you think. So I was using this almost as a mirror, like I was talking about before, to help them view their own conversation, their own learning, sort of from a third person angle. So then they read it and parts of the audio recording they listened to. And then we came together as a group a second time and had a meta reflection that was focused on that transcript and on what was it that we saw ourselves thinking about and um, asking and, and um, what ideas came out of that. And that's um, the data I want to share with you today. For me then, oops. for me then, I'm sort of one more onion ring out. So I wanted to know how elements of their group 
such as their interaction patterns, the transcripts I was showing back to them, um, videos, we also videoed the classroom interactions. How did those things serve to mediate their conceptual development? So we've already got this that's happening, and so I come in from the outside, and I'm looking at the interactions of this group. So then, um, in the time remaining, I want to share with you some preliminary analysis. And I've got a handout. I think now is a good time to give it to you. Actually, no, it's not. Let me share one more thing, then I'll give it to you. So this is one, uh, one way I'm thinking about the data using activity theory to look at the complexity of the interactions um, because part of the reality is that um, there are different ways in which they are able to enact and to put into practice certain things that they've thought about and there are other ways in which they are not able to enact and put in practice things that they care about and they want to do. So one way to make sense of this, uh, if we start over on the left where it says subject, so this is just the people that were in the group, but also um, anyone more broadly that's really interested in this core goal. So how to achieve student-centered engagement and intellectual curiosity, um, and sort of a secondary interest of theirs, theirs was how do we use authentic materials at the beginning levels? Like this is a real dilemma of how to do that. So. What were the tools that they were using? They were pulling in, and this is just a small bit of, um, of what they're pulling in, right? And, and these are things that came out in interviews or in formal conversations. Um, everyone in the group had been to a Carlos Summer Institute. Some of them had been to several. Um, they had all sorts of ideas that came up for them out of that that was mediating uh, at least their desires to be able to do this, and in many ways, their actions to be able to enact it. Um, one of the individuals is a graduate of SLE, of Second Language Education's program in CEHD. Um, all of them are, were participating and do participate in PD that happens in Asian languages and literatures. It goes on and on and on, not only into what they were doing at that time, but lots of their prior learning experiences prior teaching, their prior experiences, learning language, all of these things feed into their complex understanding of how to achieve this goal that they have. Along the bottom then, there's different rules. So partially, um, the group, it took a little while for us to figure out how to lead, how to take leadership over our own questions because um, in many ways they were used to PD being very top down. And so for PD to be something they were taking ownership of, this was a um, transition for them. Another huge struggle was the role of the textbook. This constrained some of what they wanted to be able to do. It also afforded some of the things they wanted to be able to do, right? So depending on what was the content of the textbook allowed them to be able to try certain things or not. Um, their own beliefs about language learning and sort of the rules of how that's done uh, definitely constrained some of what they could try or would try, um, and different cultural expectations. Um, and then community, this is um, just looking at all the different people that were part of supporting them, in a sense. And then finally, the division of labor, I think, is really interesting. And this gets into power um, as well. So I had an interesting role. I was part of the group, but not part of the group. I was um, sort of an outside advisor, but I was also um, a friend in many ways. Um, also, there were differences in age and then structures who could take leadership of certain things based on who's older. Um, and then how they fit within their own departments and what are the different power structures there, um, again, allowed for, um, sorry, allowed for and constrained different um, different ways they were able to put into practice some of these things. All right, so I'm in the middle of making sense of the, this is the macro analysis. I'm in the middle of making sense of the micro analysis with conversation analysis. So the other piece of data I'd really like to share with you, um, oh my goodness, um, comes from, I'm going to play for you a couple of excerpts of these debrief conversations that they have. Thanks, Dan. 
because I'd like you to hear some of the, the, the ways that they were talking about their learning, and then I want to share with you what they've identified as their learning moments. Unfortunately, I was sitting way closer to the mic than they were, so I apologize. My voice is kind of obnoxiously loud. I'll wait till everybody's got it. So this section, um, this first excerpt, um, we're debriefing Minori's teaching. And Ayumi is, is asking her and kind of giving her some, some um, feedback related to the order in which she did things and related to the speed in which she did things. Um, so let's hear that. Oh, the second thing is that, you know, like, I did so many activities in it, and then I felt like I haven't, you know, like, I, I couldn't do each of the activity free. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what I felt kind of about it. It was good flow, but, I, like, uh, you know, that's kind of because you did many, so many uh, activities, yeah. uh, I didn't quite uh, sure which one you want to emphasize more. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know, boom, 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 like, you know, this is not like climax or like mm. coming down or like yeah. that, like a closing time. Mm -hmm. I wanted, I think it, it was good though, like engaged. Yeah, I, I think I wanted to put um, the most emphasis on the writing part. Oh, like okay. last one? Yeah, the last one. So I took like, like 12 minutes or something. Mm -hmm. But the before that, you know, like a warming up activity <laughs> took longer than I thought, mm -hmm. you know, like. Um, especially the info gap thing, you know, uh, that was kind of too much. And the reading. Yeah. That maybe. one took a long time, I feel yeah. like. Maybe it's, it should be separated reading, like, and the next day probably do, like, uh, revisit the same mm -hmm. thing, like, uh, what we did, uh -huh. like, with textbook and then yeah. like, discussion session. Um, it's kind of, it's, I think, like, it's good out. Uh, like uh, all the materials, like for two days, I guess, better to just to break into two yeah. days. Mm -hmm. There's so many things. All right. So one of the first things I noticed with this conversation is how they really went back to um, focusing on what the teacher was doing rather than what the students were doing. So that was one struggle um, that, that we had to really try to implement that way of doing lesson study. Um, and try to reshift our gaze. That, that was hard. Um, but it, what's interesting to me is Minori's, one of her um, observations when listening to the debriefs, um, she said, um, oh goodness, where did it go? During the conversation, it seems like you're getting everything. And indeed, you are learning and thinking and processing. But if you go the extra step, listen to the conversation, engage in meta-analysis, listen to the conversation as a third person. It makes a difference. It led to a shift in focus of how I observed others' classes before I was focusing on what the teacher was doing. But actually, what I want to focus on is what students are doing, the learning that's happening. So she found that this was a reminder that the way we teach is not necessarily the way that the students are learning. So I thought it was really interesting that out of that, out of actually receiving some feedback on her teaching, um, one uh, result for her was it started to think through how she could shift her focus actually when she observed. Um, she talked about the feedback and how it could have felt really face threatening to her. Um, but she said that there were elements of it that were really, um, that made it meaningful. And she thought that this group because of the structure of lesson study, because of the structure of it being a group of individuals that knew each other well, it didn't feel evaluative, either on a professional level or on a personal level, because the feedback was extremely sensitive, it was extremely specific, it was constructive, and she said most importantly because it bridged to the future of, well, maybe next time you could split it this way, you could do it this, um, you could think about it in a different way. So she said then that um, professional relationships that they had um, really enabled her to take what really seemed like critical feedback, but actually ended up being really, really useful. Oops. 
Let me share a second example now. So this is on the back. And in this case, she, um, hold on a second. Yeah, so this, this comes later in the conversation as compared to excerpt one. So chronologically, it's coming later. And so she's, she's ending, the excerpt starts with her ending sort of the sense of the flow of the lesson. Um, but then she gets a question from Sugyung related to vocabulary. So this is something that had been coming up a lot. Um, when do you give students the vocabulary and the definition straight out? Or when do you let them go through the reading and try to figure out some of it from the context? And so they were wrestling with how to um, teach vocabulary. And it tied into engagement for them because um, they felt that some of them had been giving these long lists of words and students were not very engaged with this. And so they were trying to make sense of, well, how can we make it more engaging but still make sure that they know what the meanings are? Yeah, now I think I have better kind of flow in my mind that how yeah. next time mm -hmm. I would teach the, uh, this content, the same content. Mm -hmm. The same content. Mm -hmm. The content I thought was really engaging. And students seemed engaged by it, I think. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Ask, you know, why you don't put some uh, new vocabulary? Mm. Mm. Like, I, because I, I do, I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah, what's the tension it? there? Yeah. That's what's a good question the, to, to think about. Wait, do you... Do oh, you what's the difference? Have, yeah, I mean, uh, why, why you... Why I don't, uh, yeah. why I don't put... Yeah, I was like... I mean, mm. just, I'm doing it, so I was just curious. Oh yeah, I am still as a teacher. I have I'm not hundred percent sure which one is better because mm. um, so we we are doing in integrated perform performance assessment and then mm. for the IPA part they uh, we don't put any assistance uh, in like so mm -hmm. I wanted to practice and then get you know students uh, used to okay. this because in mm -hmm. the real world they don't have you know like a <laughs> the <Okay>. English word. <laughs> All right. So looking back on this area, this was a, um, an excerpt that Minori identified. Um, she said this was a really meaningful moment for her, especially the areas marked in gray. Um, and so she said this conversation helped her to really, in a sense, do some self-assessment of her own teaching and to reflect on her own teaching and to think through and to be able to be honest about thinking through what she wasn't sure about. Um, and so the meta-analysis, being able to go back later and read this conversation, um, she talked about how experiencing that meta-analysis um, led to ways of taking ownership of her own learning. Um, and then finally, a point that I made a minute ago, um, in both of these examples, she talked about how um, it really helped her to switch the focus by, by being able to look at her own conversation, her own words and participation in the conversation, um, that it contributed to her looking differently at the work of other teachers in the classroom and at her own work in the classroom and thinking about um, what is it the students are doing and how do I use that as data to inform my sense of what I try next. And, um, so, looking, on, looking through this then, I feel, um, I feel really excited about the role that this transcript and looking back at conversations sort of through a third lens um, can have um, on facilitating um, these types of conversation and these types of meta-analysis. A few things I'm trying to think through. Um, What's the role of the facilitator? What was my role? And so it seemed like one big role was the sifter um, to try to help bring to the surface um, some of the things that they were um, talking about and some of the questions they were and figure out ways to help them move the conversation forward. Um, but this is a, a complicated role, I think, um, because inevitably I am guiding the conversation and inserting uh, my own beliefs into the conversation as I'm doing this. Um, another implication, it seems that the recorded debrief is um, a useful second stimulus, maybe even a third stimulus. I, I don't know how much to, to mess with this idea of, of double stimulation quite yet. Um, and then finally, from the activity theory 
perspective, then um, one reason that I think the process worked, maybe worked is not quite the right word, uh, one reason they, the individuals experienced a lot of um, success in it was that they had a lot of freedom to innovate um, various things within their curriculum. So they had a lot of freedom to go in and try different things um, and to be able to come back to the group and say, hey, we tried this, it worked pretty well, or it totally didn't work at all. Um, and so because they had freedom to actually explore and experiment, that worked. Um, it led to them being able to, to use lesson study in productive ways. I think this is transferable across contexts. Um, it reminds me a lot of my work in clinical supervision. Um, it reminds me also of in K-12 PLCs when candidates are in different placements and bringing together individuals around um, shared pedagogical concerns as opposed to um, the seeming lines that divide us content-wise, um, language-wise, whatever it might be. Um, there's actually a lot of shared dilemmas and we can, um, by sort of shifting some of our focus to what our students are doing, I think, um, and coming together with a mind for inquiry, um, then we can have really productive conversations that are even better because it's a, a diverse set of experiences. I think also of language departments, especially in small schools, where you may have individuals that are um, the only Spanish teacher, the only Chinese teacher, the only French teacher, right? And so as a potential um, professional development model um, for these types of departments. And then I think, finally, of ESL teachers who do this type of work all the time. They do collaborative work all the time um, because they're constantly working across content areas. Um, and so as a potential model for um, inquiry around working with language learners um, in the mainstream. And with that, I am going to finish and leave us a few minutes for questions. So thank you. D. So you mentioned earlier that the observations and lesson study were supposed to focus on what students are doing. Yep. You mentioned earlier that, that was a challenge for this group. And indeed, your excerpts yep. suggest that that was a challenge. So did they yep. get to a point where they were able to actually focus on what students were doing rather than what the teacher was doing? Yeah, so it's sort of, I, it, it looks like this is what I noticed. Yeah, I didn't share one of those examples because these are the, I wanted to focus on the ones that they pulled out is really relevant for them. Um, but you do see it. I wish I had an example to show you right now. Um, but this you see more. Yeah, but they did. They had moments where they were talking about um, student behavior and student activity. One thing that I think I made it challenging, and I think one of, the, um, one of the things that made it challenging and one thing that was hard, we were working across languages, right? So there's usefulness, and that, that affords and that constraints certain things. So what it afforded was that the conversations never turned into, wow, I, I, the way this textbook does this frustrates me or um, this is our common challenge with working through this grammatical thing, because they didn't have that in common, right? So that's what I think it afforded to be a diverse group, or one of many things. The constraint, though, you go in the classrooms, just like when I've um, um, done clinical supervision in a Chinese classroom, there's a lot that I don't know what's going on, right? Um, so some of their ability to talk about what students were doing ended up being at a more surface level rather than being able to look at language production, right? So in that way, if they had had more homogenous language similar groups, maybe it, uh, surely it would have looked different. I'm not sure how. Yeah. Dan? Uh, on the other hand, if I don't know what students are talking about, I might be able to observe their engagement a lot more. Mm -hmm than getting involved in the content. Yeah, I mean, it's both and, right? Because as soon as you can tune into this thing, then you maybe start ignoring this other thing, or the thing that you're understanding. If I'm understanding everything the kids are saying, that serves as a distraction for other things. So maybe in the, if we go back to the triangle mediation, I think it, it can look both ways. So a homogenous grouping or a heterogeneous grouping mediates different um, forms of conceptual development. 
Gabriel. As you all went through this, yeah. did you find that there were certain themes that were brought up, shared themes that were really surprising to people? Mm. That might be themes in common? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Let's see. Well, one thing they talked about a lot was um, like the cultural differences and similarities between them. And so that ended up being sort of, maybe I should have seen that that was going to happen, but I was really pleasantly um, tickled, I guess, that they had as many conversations as they did by being in this group that doesn't necessarily, languages that don't necessarily come together as frequently, and how much they were learning about, um, about each other's individual experiences and as, as members of their cultural groups. But then also sort of the, the way that their students were, um, how can I say it, adjusting to experiences with these cultures that were different for them. Yeah. I remember one really interesting conversation they had. Um, how many of you are familiar with Arabic in the sense that there is, bueno, Gabriel is. Um, there's sort of like standard Arabic and then there's sort of colloquial Arabic. And so we had this really interesting conversation about trying to find authentic materials in all of their languages. And the challenge, you know, Rasha was telling us, you know, you have no idea how hard this is. <laughs> and it was really eye-opening for all of us to think through the challenge of authentic materials and then to really problematize what is authentic. And so that was a really fruitful conversation because none of us really understood the extent to which um, the language of the classroom and the language of the community was so different. So that's one. Yeah, thanks for asking. Dan. Oh, yeah. Sarah. This is kind of related to kind of the people was talking about the engagement. Did you spend any time talking about what engagement is? Because mm -hmm. that's another thing that your perception of engagement or not may vary by your personal context, your cultural context. Your cultural context, context. yeah. So I would see in a group like this, I'd be very interested to know who, like what was everybody's own definition of engagement and do you need to or would you recommend that you establish a definition of that before you, or as a part of yeah, yeah. What is engagement? Right. So we did look at it a little, not a little bit, a lot, and thought it through. And um, the group came to a messy <coughs> sort of sense of what it might be. Um, if I had to try to sum up where they reached, it was that um, student learning would become autonomous. That's, that's sort of where they got to with engagement. Um, and that that would look like students being active in participation in the classroom would be some of the behaviors of what that would look like. Yeah. Yeah. But it was, to me, um, it, this was a tension I had of how much do I bring in other people's ideas of what it is? How much do they co-construct their own? How much is it both? Um, and how much, because it's culturally embedded, what happens when the culture of, this, of the predominant majority of the students bumps up against right, the, the sort of ideas of what engagement is of the instructors? So, so we had a lot of these conversations. I, I don't know that we came to any consensus over any of it, really, because it's hard to, right? I thought it was awesome, or I wouldn't be up here talking about it. Um, yeah. Yep. How? Okay, so here's what I think is hard about it. I think the blocks, the barriers to it, um, especially at the K-12 level, we have to give people time to do things. We have to give teachers time to work with each other. Um, and in higher ed, that's no less true. It just looks differently in how you structure the day. Um, I think where this is hard, um, something I didn't talk as much through, but I'll just. Uh, so some of the research coming out of communities of practice work shows that when the groups form organically, the way this one did, um, you tend to see, 
I don't want to say better results, but better cohesion of the group, right? Um, better dynamics. Um, so how you scale that up, I think is challenging. I'm not entirely sure. I think the other thing that makes it challenging is transcription. So um, actually having somebody sit down and transcribe this meeting so you can have it back. So um, I'd say in order to make it work, there has to be some money uh, available, <laughs> right there, um, to help support um, the needs, kind of the behind the scene needs to make any professional development work that the individual teachers do not have time to do. Um, so I think those would be crucial things that would need to happen in order to make it work. But um, it works really well in Japan. Entire schools are doing this. And everyone in the school is involved in a group. And it goes year, year long, year after year. Sometimes they work in two, three year cycles. And um, at the end of this, they put on a whole celebration for the school and the community to say this is to really celebrate the professionalism of teachers. This is what our teachers looked into this year and last year and the year before and, and this is what they're thinking about and this is what they've tried. Elaine? I feel like it might, and especially if it was a whole school endeavor, then you can benefit from the diversity and the cross-pollination through sharing what other groups are finding. But because the group can really have access to the language itself rather than just the external behaviors, then yeah, I wonder. It'd be worth trying. Yeah. <laughs> this is just a real, yeah. when they did it in Japan, did yep. they transcribe? No. Okay. That's different. That's what I've added. Yeah. All right. Yep. Great question. Uh, 